Hi, everyone. We're going to wait a little bit more. We should have 22 right now. Um, that's about right. If you have a question, or I, I just thought I only, it was so intense, Ty and Simon, the amount of information that, that one was getting from your talk. I hope um, it was okay. You just can't tell when you're actually giving the talk. You don't know how it's, how it's so, going. Especially now, because our audience is there, not in front of us, you know, um, they're not right. shouting at you. Um, so, um, hey, Raphael, very nice. Thank you for putting our, our virtual screen up. Uh, you can download that from our website. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's such a thick subject, and I know it's very difficult to do in such a short time. Um, I tried to answer as many questions as I could while right. Simon was talking. I wasn't listening to him. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> but, but the good thing is it will be available. The entire talk will be available. It'll be on our HMCT YouTube site. And I have to tell you, if it wasn't for HMCT, Clifford Pun, my senior coordinator, this whole process, he's up there, this whole process would just fall apart. Um, thank you, Clifford, and Susan Malmstrom, and Rachel Elnor, who is our wonderful consulting assistant. But anyway, we're here to talk about more serious questions about type. And um, if you have anyone, I'm sure, just have a question you can raise. If you don't have a question, then mute so we don't hear dogs and kids in the background. I think that's important. Um, and uh, so Dan, your question. Yeah, my question is um, to Ty about your eight phase parameters. Uh, which is a classic assignment. Right. I've tried to teach it several times and then I usually pass it off to somebody who's like, can you do this? Uh, I teach at a public university, by the way, so it's mm -hmm. like that compressed kind of time. The biggest problem I have is, is um, really teaching them how to use a grid. And I noticed that you go off, you all go off the grid pretty quickly in terms of just the upright 90 degree Right. Grid. Right. Right. So how do how do you like to me? That's the, there's a whole that's a wild card in terms of the parameters as well. Right. Um, yeah, Dan. I, I and I completely understand that. Um, so you know, the, the grid is to me, it's probably the 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 best tool any typographer can have in their toolkit. <laughs> it really is. And me saying that, being some uh, you know, having gone to school like again at Art Center in the nineties and. I mean, I took type two with Simon actually, I think, <laughs> right? And so, and so- um, In history. Yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, we don't spend a lot of time going over grids because it's so much content to go over. But what I do is I, I, I just give them a basic grid, a, a basic grid, right? A modular grid, right? Because um, it's easy to handle those, right? I, I go over the setup. I, go, I talk about grids. I do some lecturing on grids. I show a video um, that actually Sean Adams has on LinkedIn about grids and grid structure. Uh, and uh, I could share that. I, I, it's on the LinkedIn learning um, uh, site. Uh, it's uh, Sean Adams. He talks about grids. So you can, you can find it really easily on there, right? I share that first because he talks about uh, the, the, the different types of grids, uh, modular grids, you know, multiple column grids, um, things of that nature. But, but what I do with my class is I focus, so the first, the first one or two phases in that course, I mean, in that project, I kind of let the, the, first, the, first, the first phase, I kind of let them do what they're going to do just to see where they are and how much knowledge they have, right? Um, and then in the second one, in the second phase, I start lecturing on typographic organizational systems, which comes out of Kimberly Elm's book, which is really, really good, right? And so I start talking about, first I talk about the axial system to get them sort of, bait, sort of used to this idea of how you can control content. And then in week three, the third or fourth, the third phase and getting into the fourth phase, I introduced them to the grid system in phase three, and then I forced them to use it for phase four and phase five they have to use it in those phases. And then for the, for the phases after that, they become used to it. So now it's like, now they know how they can control content with a simple modular grid. It's really simple, either four columns or six columns. 
It's a, a 7.5 live area, so it's a small space. So you can't have too many columns in that space, right? So, so just, just getting them really used to a simple, very simple use of how to, how, first of all, how to, what grid to use, modular grid system, and how to build one, which is really, really simple, and how you control text in it. That's, once you do that and you keep that sort of going from phase to phase to phase, they start to get used to it. Mm. So that's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, if I can just add to that, so one of the key things about this, um, you know, increasing, changing the parameters slowly, um, you know, the, the fact that when you start with just one size, one weight in the first week, um, you know, they, they, they think they're suddenly dealing with, you know, how's this going to work? But when they walk into the room, everyone's got their work up and you point out to them that some of these things look absolutely beautiful. Some of them look absolutely terrible. How can that be when they're all using the same point size, the same typeface and the same language? Right. They're all using exactly the same raw material. So the only difference between those studies is their control of the space. Right. Um, control of interval and negative space. Right. And once they get that understanding, everything follows, follows right. from the, that. And the other thing, Dan, that I should have mentioned is um, with the grid system, I mean, especially in the 7.5 square space that we use as a live area, though that four to six column grid works well with smaller point sizes. Uh, and what a student has to learn and what I teach is that in a four column or six column grid, if you're using multiple sizes, some of the content in your column grid is not going to fit into one of the columns. So what you have to do is you have to create another box that fits into the modular grid system that'll go across two columns that'll allow you to put larger point sizes in. So I have to make sure that they understand that as well. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing uh, to that same point, um, Ty, is that uh, I think the students, once they understand the, the, the grids are gonna give them it's almost like spatial rhyming opportunities. And once they, once they understand that that uh, sense of um, order, shall we call it, um, mm -hmm. to, the, to the content, actually yeah. trans translates to a viewer as intelligence in the material. Right. And so Absolutely. they want to, they want to trust it. It looks organized, it looks trustworthy. It looks yeah. like it's, there's some intelligence behind it. So um, one of the things I always say to them is that basically your, your typography becomes like a map of your thinking. If you if you if you understand the material and, um, uh, you know, understand the hierarchies, then we're going to see that in the, in the work. If you don't understand the material and you're thinking about it as vague, we're going to see that in your work as well. Because it's, right. it's the, 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 your typography, essentially, it's like, not like you're naked, but you, you could, it's, it becomes a psychological print of how you're thinking. Right. Um, and so the sense of order and, and sequence, um, although some of them resist this idea of working heavily with grids to start with yeah. because they think it's going to stop from being creative. I'm an artist. Yeah. I want to throw things around. Yeah. Um, but once they understand that if they really want to do that, um, uh, you know, you can create the best disorder by understanding order. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, slowly they get that sense of, okay, I need to make things that do look intelligent. So I do need this sense of internal spacing and interval yeah. and so yeah, cool. and, and again, Dan, again, in the studies that I showed, when they get to the very last phase, which is the experimental expressive phase, you know, it's like I tell them, it's like, yeah, you can experiment with the use of imagery and prototyping of typography, but you still have to control the content. So you can't have your imagery and your text competing with each other, right? So it creates this sort of tension. And I said, the thing that helps you the most, especially when you have imagery that has strong edit, that has strong material in it, is holding that content with a grid system, especially the smaller point sizes. And when they, when they, when they figure that out, it's like you can see the lights go on in their head. Yeah, same thing happens in, in those uh, type three um, movie projects, movie uh, poster assignments. Yeah. Um, they're working with imagery and they suddenly realize, well, Actually, if the imagery is providing the disorder and the drama and the interest, mm -hmm. then the type, by contrast, yeah. needs to be quiet Absolutely. and, and ordered, Absolutely. and then they both work, work really well together. Absolutely. The, the other thing, and I, and I think uh, we have to remember why we start with uh, type one, the study of letter forms. Letter forms inherently in themselves create grids and structures, especially words. So if you think about the basic structure, this is not my thinking, but someone like, uh, uh, Froshov, 
the interesting uh, typography instructor from uh, London. Um, in letter forms themselves are inherently grids. So if you start with the basic, you know, atom of the letter form, then it's natural that it builds out into a grid. So That's why it's so super important to, for them to see the archetype press, the letter press. They get that sense of units and... Uh, Right, and Beautiful. the modularity of it. In exactly. fact, when yeah. and 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 the students who do uh, font design, which is the opposite end of you know our archetype, you might say, when you're developing digital fonts, the students tend to come back to archetype uh -huh. to be reminded that the gridding and the modularity of type is important to the designing of their typefaces. So I wanted um, to to ask something related to that. Um, I'm Amy, I teach letterpress printing at the School of Visual Concepts in Seattle. And I've been thinking a lot about how to integrate better with our um, teaching of typography within the school and branching into more of our UX and UI students and really bringing it back to that hands-on. So I'm curious, what, um, how do you connect what you're teaching in type one and type two into those projects um, at Archetype Press? And if well, that's not appropriate for here, let me know. Well, we'll, we'll answer it quickly. Christina Almond's here. She's an one of the instructors, my instructors at Archetype Press. And what we started, and Simon, this is part of the new curriculum, is obviously there's just so much you can do in one course. So what Simon has done and what the school has done is we try to bring the students at least for one session into Archetype and, and, and try to show them the basics of typographic structure in metal and how it, mm. it worked and it was designed in metal. And it's, it's really, I, I, I think it's really awakened a lot of the students, whether they're interaction or UX or UI or AI students, where when they see the physicality of it. So there's a little bit of history given. Um, obviously, Amy, it's, you have to convince the person who's teaching the digital courses, the value of having the students come right. into your, yes. your press, right? That's, I mean, that's why I'm trying to integrate myself back into the digital side of the teaching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, again, I, I like to say I float between two worlds, mm -hmm. very right. much so. Right. And, and I, you know, it's not either or, right. it's, it's just the technology. And I think, again, we're lucky at Art Center to have both yeah. You know, uh, and we have a, a huge, you know, letterpress facility. Um, and it's, well, we're not there now, though. See, it shows the phallus. It shows some of the difficulties and something like this happens in a digital environment. We're locked out of the press, you know, so. Maybe, oh. Amy, if you talk, if you talk to, uh, to code junkies about monospace fonts, um, <laughs> That'll get them back in the press if you talk to, if you say we've got some of the early monospace fonts that are used. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've already I've already talked about M units and how I can just okay. show them what that means and the students can really grasp um, how to think in responsive um, ways through letterpress. But mm -hmm. anyway, thank you. I appreciate the answer. We can have that private discussion because we're constantly. Uh, having that discussion of the value of letterpress and the digital and understanding type and understanding type and structure. So it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing discussion, which I think should be stopped immediately because it's not gonna go away. And I think it just supports you know, the, the digital technology. I had an interesting, and we'll move on, we want to, uh, people should be asking questions, but I had an interesting discussion with Phil Gilbert, who's the head of IBM Design. And he came to Art Center to look at all the AR, VR. And you know what he was fascinated by? He was fascinated by the letterpress shop because he sees a technology that students are not trying to wrestle with. They already understand that's an orchestration of the technology. It's, you don't have to wrestle it. And he said he wishes the digital environment would understand that you have to learn how to orchestrate your technology instead of try to force your technology. So he immediately saw the relevance of having, you know, uh, an analog studio for type. I, I was just going to share that one uh, assignment that um, I've adapted 
that I found had a lot of luck with is sort of a backdoor into typography. Before, because I had to teach a class where it's basically typography and beginning uh, visual communication in the same semester. So it was really compressed, but the, the, I, I would actually start before we got into any type terminology or anatomy, uh, every student would get a letter form and we do the cropping exercise. So it's just large croppings uh, in a square as a way to start talking about positive and negative space. Yeah. And it gets them learning about the details yeah. and the yeah. anatomy. And then that, there's a way in there which that discussing that stuff can be deadly, but they've already fell in love with the forms first and then you can kind of uh, right. talk about everything else. So. Anyone else have a question? Raise your hand. Unmute, ask the question, or else I'll continue asking. Um, I see a uh, lot of people. Hmm? Uh, a question. I was going to dissent on the grid. Actually, <laughs> uh, a lot. I'm a, I teach uh, type design to fourth year students. And most of the time, I'm trying to get them off the grid because they think that they can combine lines and circles and rectangles, and it doesn't work. So, uh, and uh, Fiona Ross uh, said it really well. She said, to make them look equal, we had to make them not equal. Because uh, optical illusions are very big in letter forms. And uh, it's very hard. There's no science to it necessarily. But, uh, for example, the fact that horizontal strokes appear thicker than vertical ones, even if they're mathematically the same. See, Haran, I, I, I understand what you're talking about in terms of font design, but here we're talking about before font design. Composition? Yeah, here we're, yeah, we're talking, talking more about composition. We're talking more about composition. We're not talking, this module doesn't enter into the design of type. It enters into how one uses or organizes information on a page. That's the Somebody difference. mentioned letter forms, I wasn't sure. No, no, no. I, I just mentioned that because we found that you know, understanding the basic letter form, we're not talking about, they're not yet at designing their own letters, but understanding the grid to help them organize information. When we talk about type, you know, essential typography in terms of- Here's a question, how early or late should that start? Should what start? Letter form design. I don't know. I, I mean, I think Simon and Ty, you actually. You mean you mean how early should it start in in an undergraduate education? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Well, yes. we do it. We do it at our center. It's the first thing that you do. I mean, you know, you don't you don't do. So if you if you saw the this chart that Simon showed, the foundation courses at Art Center start with letter form design. Well, well no, they're not, not actually not just, no no. Yeah, they're not designing no. completely new letter forms. No. They're designing the. They're either working, they're, they're doing some, um, you know, broad knit pen uh, explorations of thicks and thins and what, where historical humanist or black letter forms came from, just in terms of experiencing the full range of the historical, uh, let's say, different technologies from which letter forms came from. So at that point, they're, they're just doing that for an understanding and they're doing some, um, they may do some uh, you know, tracings or drawing out of certain existing letter forms, but they're not mm. yet designing new letter forms. Mm. That comes in, in that curriculum that I showed you, that can come in, um, as I mentioned in one of my um, exercises for that typographic identity, some students do start developing their own letter forms just for that little conference logo. But really it starts to happen either in identity design, um, the next class, or else digital font design in uh, fourth term. Mm. So they're already, I guess, I guess in terms of full on font, designing a new font, that'll, that'll happen in digital font design, which I think is fourth uh, and or fifth, fifth term. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty late. It's a, little, it's a little later. They've gone through yeah. basic core. And they're I usually- they And they're uh, usually- state, um, Sorry, go ahead. They're usually combining that. You can see them developing um, maybe a, a font design, a font in font design, and they might apply it to what would be considered transmedia, or they have a need to develop an alphabet for the type five, which we didn't even talk about today. That'll be talked about tomorrow, because that in itself is yet, I, I think, at Art Center, the ultimate level of the use of typography and communication. So it's not really this, what we're talking about today is not about letter form design today. It's about the use of typography, general foundation 
class, not um, because we understand that designing of letter forms in itself, I thought I was crazy setting type in metal, but I think people who are letter form designers, type designers, that's another level, Harrod. Um, but- um, Thank you, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Is there any, any more questions or Simon, Ty, did you want to talk a little bit more about well, just, just the, the, the digital little, experience? A little, mm -hmm. uh, an anecdote that I've always quite enjoyed with regard to the difference between letter form design those that create the forms and those that, let's say, use the forms um, is the idea of, of um, the miller and the baker. Um, that is, the miller um, creates and grows the, uh, uh, um, grinds the flour, but doesn't, make, doesn't bake the bread. So the letter form designer is, is creating the, the flour, as it were, uh, and, the, and the baker is the typographer that uses those forms. Um, I think it's, I mean, there's a, there are people that do both, but um, historically it's been, you know, a letter form designer, that's all, that's, that's a life's work in itself, um, concentrating on that. Whereas using the forms is, is a, I would say, a somewhat different skill. Um, Parant, do you, do you, uh, you create letter forms, but do you, are you also uh, a designer in, in the more general sense of using forms or do you exclusively design letter forms? It's, it's extremely rare that I can actually use fonts well. Uh, I make them. I don't know how to use them. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I guess, uh, I guess so that was my point. When I, when when I try to design something, I think it's cool, but people look at it and they're honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank uh, you for the honesty. You're right. <laughs> Pedro, did you uh, want to ask? I have a comment. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. I was I was wondering from between this transition between the the first approach when using one one font one size, how do you address the um, the structuring of information? So, if I can make this simple, how do you address the the styling of when you go into InDesign and do paragraph and and character style? So, how do you address the the structuring of the texts with students? So for for me, uh, for the type two course, um, what it really is about for me in terms of structuring, uh, first is it, most importantly, it's getting students to understand the content, right? And so we don't do a lot of, in the, in the type two class, we don't use a lot of heavy content. We keep, especially the first project, if you notice what I was showing, there's a minimum amount, minimal amount of content, and that's what we call discontinuous text. So we're not using, we're not doing edit, editorial, we're not doing typesetting from that standpoint, right? And so the focus there is, is getting students to look at the content, uh, take the content apart and look at similarities in the content, and then having them structure their compositions based on how you create groupings within that content. Right. It's more about that. Um, I think in, in Simon's type three class, he probably do it. He does probably does a little bit, a little bit more because we don't do in our second project in, in the type two course, we use a little bit more editorial text. But for the most part, the type two class is really based on, uh, you know, uh, a series of exercises that 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 build a certain amount of skill sets. Right. So we're only using mostly discontinuous content, but it's it really important for students to to analyze uh, and take and really look at content, right? And you'll be surprised how seldom this is done. I mean, when we say we don't, people don't read, students don't read either, right? I have to force them, really literally force them to look, look at the content, look at certain characters. How many characters are there? What is some of, are you see some similar uh, in terms of how many characters there are, how long the, how long the titles are, uh, what letter forms, what numerals do you have in terms of, so when, they, when they're able to really look at that, then they can make decisions compositionally that bring some of those similarities together, right? And so, so deconstructing and analyzing information is really, really a part of what, we, what I do in the type two class. Simon, you might, you might answer that in a different way. Yeah, no, I, I think um, what's important is this sense of giving them some raw material that could be 20 separate elements. It could be five groupings. Uh, it could be time-based information, list of names. You're going to be able to group things together different ways and understanding that by creating different groupings, you're creating different um, design possibilities. Uh, and so this happens with all material that you're working with. Um, 
any time you're given raw material from a from a client for a job or whatever, for a post or whatever it might be, you've got to analyze how many levels of hierarchy out there are there, how many therefore decisions decisions are you going to make about either scale or weight change or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so analysis, as Ty is saying, analysis of the raw material to start with. Um, that's the starting point for the decisions about how many typefaces or sizes or whatever you're, you're going to be using. Right. So it's, it's, right. it's super important that this, as I mentioned, you know, you've, you've got to care about language and getting the students to care about language, getting yeah. them to read is, you know, that's, that's a challenge in itself, but they do get better at it. <laughs> I have to say they do improve. It's cumulative. Yeah. Yeah. J Jenny, you have a question. Hi. Um, yes, I do. I'm Jenny. I'm a new teacher over at Laguna College of Art and Design. Uh, Thank you for teaching. identifying yourself. Sorry, Pedro, oh. you didn't identify yourself. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, um, I just started teaching typography one, so I'm very, I'm very new. Um, but I was curious about the eight phases. Would you find that is the perfect number for like the number of phases and all the different additions? Because I feel like you could there's, there's an infinite number of times you could probably add to it and the number of steps. So if you had more time during the term, would you add more phases to it or dive deeper into certain concepts? <laughs> um, no, I wouldn't actually. I okay. think, uh, actually, I think that project takes up too much of the term actually, for me uh, because, mm -hmm. because we have a, we have a our, our terms are 14 weeks. That first project that you saw that type two structures, that takes up 10 weeks. That first project mm -hmm. is due, the final of that project is due in week 10. So by the time they finish that project, we've got only four weeks left to do the second project, which is a type specimen project. So the truth is, I would, I would love to shorten it, but mm -hmm. I, I just think the skill sets that students gain from that project, from phase one all the way to phase eight, I think are so, are so important that, um, you could see the growth happen. And I think it takes that amount of time to actually see that. So what happens is by the time they do phase eight and before they print their book, before they do their final book and, pre and, pre and present it in week 10, I tell them, now that you've gone through all of eight phases, go back to your first few phases and redo them. Because all those things that you learned going through some of those later phases, you can come back and you're gonna make some serious changes. So again, to me, as a, as, as, you know, as a designer and typographer and you've been doing this for a while, I can always look back on my earlier work that I did in my career and go, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and again, this is for all of us. We never stop learning. We never ever stop learning. Typography is one of those things you just feel like you just don't know enough about, you know what I mean? And so, for what the students, and to answer your question, no, I wouldn't, I would, I would, not, I, would I would love to make it shorter, but I wouldn't make it longer. Right. Sure. Yeah, I think, right. I think it could be, it could be abbreviated. I think one through, one through five, one through six are totally essential. Mm -hmm. I think with the color as an addition, yeah. you know, is, is fun. Uh, number eight, the experimental one, it's really just to give them a bit of a present at the end of what is a long and arduous journey. Uh, that involves a lot of rigor and a lot of discipline. So giving them something experimental at the end takes a little bit of the, the pain away. Um, okay. But I think one through six are the, are the core um, of that. You could, I mean, it's possible to shorten it. Sure. Hey, Jenny, so thank you for uh, yeah. opening up the door for me shortening that project. <laughs> oh, great. Lucas? Yay. Thank you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> thank you. I, I see your name is... Um, yeah, Minnesota. sorry. I... <laughs> But also, Lucas, I think you want to ask a question, and then we're going to go to, um, how do you pronounce the name, um, Viniscius? Okay, but we'll start with Lucas okay. first. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm uh, from Sweden, so that's um, sort of way, uh, mid, mid past, way past midnight. Um, but um, when I was in London to the Monotype Metal Type Museum, mm -hmm. I was fascinated by a, a, an Icelandic um, typographer called uh, Gunnar Gubriem, who has the site operina.org. It's in the chat also. Um, but he's talking about the handwriting repair and how uh, reading and writing has disintegrated because people are no longer writing by hand. And that we don't understand the letter forms because uh, they, are, uh, they are kinetic. And uh, I was just wondering, do you have any reactions on, on actually spending enough time 
because we do our type um, just totally different because we start more with a long book and long texts and and uh, classic uh, books and then go down to the smaller. So we start from from the longer text and then work our way down to smaller typography. Um, but do you have any reactions on on uh, how um, manual writing? Uh, the lack of it nowadays um, affects uh, the students' uh, understanding. I, I, you had some references to to the letterpress uh, um, workshop, but not from from actual hand, manual writing and copying of letters. Simon, no, oh, I think it's a it's a good point. I seem to remember uh, reading that was it Denmark, and certainly one other, one other country has has not made it a requirement to have handwriting exercises for, for kids in school. Um, I agree that not ha having handwriting exercises and not expecting people to write a lot of materials will damage their understanding of what letter forms are and what they do. Um, I mean, obviously they're the, the, the core fundamentals, the origin um, of humanist script and therefore all written communication. So, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's going to be an ongoing, ongoing problem. Um, I, I do wonder sometimes with some technologies, just as uh, you know, there was a whole phase of screen technology coming along where you know suddenly print was dead, and all the people that said that ironically did so in book form, of course. Um, but it, it makes me, <laughs> it makes me wonder whether the fact that handwriting has gone away with the interest rebounding in all sorts of crafts and handmade materials and the interest in ceramics, for example, and all kinds of hand driven, um, uh, I'm not going to call them hobbies, but, but pursuits, let's say, uh, have returned. It wouldn't surprise me at all if there was a, a rebounding interest in, in handwritten mm -hmm. forms. And uh, um, I would be interested to know as a letter form designer, Harant, what, what's your take on this in terms of um, handwritten exercise and, and expecting students, younger people to, to write by hand. Well, I'm glad you asked that this is a borderline blasphemous, but I'm, uh, I'm not of that school. Uh, um, I think using your hands is important. I think creating texts is extremely important for literacy, but I don't really believe that painting the black bodies of the letters is related to reading anymore. Um, there's a Japanese concept, I'm sure all you all know, called Motan, Black and White Harmony. I think that's what people read. I, mm. I don't, I can't imagine that somebody who's reading will recreate the motion of the letter being drawn as they're reading. That seems very far-fetched. So I think that what people read is the relationship of Black and White, clusters of letters, they're looking for efficiency. They're not looking at each letter individually. No, so, that's, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. that's so I true. think, and it's but here's the thing: handwritten, handmade things are visually attractive. So um, this is where I reconcile it, and I say that the more a letter form is set large and is meant to be appreciated of its own, the more handwritten shapes do matter. But the more you go smaller sizes, immersive reading, the more they become sort of an arbitrary constraint. Hmm. Um, Interesting. That's, yeah. that's... Interesting. Interesting, Haran. Um, Vinicius, your hand has been up for a while. Did I mispronounce Hi. your name? Uh, yeah, my name is Vinicius Lima. I, I teach graphic design at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. And I teach an intro to type class that's uh, very similar in terms of the pedagogy of it. It's very about exercises and understanding composition and the spatial relationships. Um, I personally, like my students have a harder time seeing that type of work as actual graphic design. Mm -hmm. I sometimes hear from them like they don't feel like they're doing real graphic design work. And I was wondering if anyone else here has that same uh, notion like they to them sometimes it feels like they have to be doing from the get-go posters and they want to make concert posters for their 
friends, bands, and yeah. instead of looking at the negative space of a Helvetica A. Let me, let me address that because um, okay. I, I totally, completely, 100% understand that because when I came to Art Center, uh, like I said earlier, in the mid 90s, um, I mean, Art Center's pedagogy methodology has its history in European, Swiss and German Bauhaus design, right? Um, but I came, I didn't come from that understanding of design and, and typography and, and just expressing myself. I just knew when I came to school that um, I had this need to do something to express myself artistically and, and doing graphic. I had taken classes at other schools, but but when I came to Art Center, the the idea of the confinement of of all this innate angst that I had inside me that needed to get out, that's what you're experiencing with these students, right? So so everybody has something that they want to say. They have something that they want to put into a visual form using, and in order for you to do that, most of the time you're going to be using typography, right? So um, I always say, and I give my students this example of what I went through when I came out of Art Center, right? Um, I, I came out of Art Center with this idea that I was going to conquer the world typographically, right? Because I came out of Art Center with the pedagogy and structure and fundamental typography, but I wasn't using that. What I, what I reverted back to, what I took some of that, I shouldn't say that, but, I, but what I reverted back to with a sort of innate, sort of, you know, or sort of really organic, intuitive design, right? And putting that sort of, a little bit of formality on top of that. And, you know, I got, I got my ass handed to me a couple of times in a couple of jobs that I went and worked at, you know, it's like, what are you doing putting that with this and moving? What are these shapes that you're using? And why are you putting the type all over the place? And why are you deconstructing the letter forms? And, you know, I mean, that's what students want. They want to do that now, right? They want to do that now. And so what I always teach, what I tell my students by my example is, you don't have to go through what I went through to really understand how formality and structure fits into design. Learn that first. You'll have all the time in the world you need to do all the sort of expressive, ex, you know, all the all of that sort of experimental stuff later. If I can address that as well, Vinicius, I think what I, I understand uh, the the problem. I think a lot of people when they start with typography, they think that uh, you know it's the support stuff that you throw at the bottom of the image, uh, and that the image is what it's about that's where the graphic design is and the, and the language is just some language that has to be yeah. there so yeah, it'll yeah. just have to be there and it looks like it didn't want to be there so you can yeah. tell so you have to get them to understand that type in itself can become image can become it doesn't need a support system uh it right. can exist on its own and you know give them some projects whereby you know maybe it's a poster maybe it's something larger scale that difference between public and private that i mentioned if it's larger scale it feels like it's communicating to a public, but maybe maybe you give them something where you know they they have to use type to create the central thing. There is no other image, and once they get this understanding that type can be enough in itself, that it can just be image, uh, it can create its own image, um, but it's also language at the same time. So it's doing double right. double duty, if you like. Once they get that understanding, then it, it changes something in them, and they realize that it's not the secondary support act. It can, yeah, be the, the, it can be the lead. The other thing that you can do is, is, is tailor the content to the students that you have, right? Tailor the content to the students that you have. Uh, and I think that would create more interest in them. I mean, it, instead of using like terminologies of, of that they're not accustomed to and names they're not accustomed to and things that we all know because we went through it, you know, and we understand the history of graphic design, stuff like that. I think if you tailor the content, that would create more interest as well. Sarah, you have a question. Yes, hi, I'm Sarah, thank you. Um, I where are you from, Sarah? Yeah. Sure, well, I'm originally from Iran, but now I'm in Washington, DC, and I run the Corcoran Design Program um, since this semester, and I have the challenging task of working the curriculum and bringing typography more and more into all of the curriculum. Anyway, so I'm now realizing it's not as easy in academia to, uh, to convince universities to pay for laser printers for all of our students, uh, which probably you all know. 
Um, I want to know how or um, what solutions you have for teaching students foundations of topography and fundamentals of topography, learning to see and understanding those uh, skills that they need to understand in usually within tangible projects. But uh, now we are teaching uh, remotely. So I really rambled on, but how would you go about uh, making it accessible for all of the students? To, keep, to learn typography without having printers necessarily? It's a good challenge. Um, I, do, I do think that uh, as, as Ty has mentioned, and as a number, of us, a number of us have experienced um, using um, programs like Miro uh, and others, it, it is possible to cover a lot of the fundamentals to do with Space, composition, scale relationships, um, they don't, you don't have to necessarily see those as printouts to, to gain those understandings. Um, it's, it's possible, I know, uh, for example, um, Alison Goodman that I mentioned, the instructor that teaches one class for product design students, um, she is doing that all remotely online with uh, using Miro, but then also having them print out like every you know, fourth week or something, they'll, they'll manage to get to a printer, they'll print out some homework and just give her a small section of it. I think it is important that they are able to see some of the work uh, in print form somehow, um, maybe not all of it, but um, your understanding of scale just changes completely when you're looking at the reality of something uh, printed rather than on screen, although obviously print a screen has its own scale realities. Um, if it's feasible at all for students to have, you know, if there's not each one, but if they can print some things out remotely, we have a we have a, a print shop at school at college where people are sending their files in. They can pick them up a couple of days later, I think. So there is there is some access, some limited access to printed materials at our college at the moment, even in these times. Um, but I think most of the most of the fundamentals that we're talking about in type one and type two are f it, it is feasible to learn those core basics um, on online on screen. You are you are missing some of the aspects of scale and distance from the material. But screen has its own kind of version of that. Um, it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky question. I don't have a a good answer other than. What I've, what I've said, but I think a lot of the fundamentals you can deal with on screen. Ty, you're, you're dealing with this now, Ty, and, and dealing with, you know, the nuances are what I think are very difficult to deal with. Don't you work with a, um, an Apple pen? Yeah, um, you know, since we trans, uh, transitioned into teaching remotely, uh, one of the things I was really, really just you know, frustrated about was how do I um, bring the experience of the physical classroom into the digital realm? And am I not giving my students enough? You know what I mean? Um, and I mean, I'm passionate about teaching and I'm passionate about typography, but I also know what I felt when I was in school and I took classes that I didn't feel like I was getting enough out of, you know, and my thing is, is I want my students to really get that experience that they're paying for. Right. And so I was trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I critique? What's the best way to make this, this experience as, as, as organic as I can with the way I actually do it in the classroom. Um, and Zoom wasn't the answer to that, right? So the Zoom tools were not providing me with um, the things that I needed to make that happen. And so um, I bought an Apple, I had just looked at some videos and, and I bought an, an iPad Pro. Uh, and I was like really looking at how intuitive the iPad Pro is in terms of how you can, with an Apple pencil and how you can actually really critique, it's like, drawing on a piece of paper because when I'm in when I'm in the classroom physically I do a lot of sketches for my students on the on the whiteboard but I also mark on their studies as well right and once I once I did that once I bought the iPad Pro um, and started using Miro as well the application Miro I found that oh whoa I, this is cool 
right? I, I, I can actually bring this, I, this experience back into the classroom when we, get, when we go back into the physical classroom as well. So it's, be, it's given me a lot of opportunities to think about other ways to actually teach. And so um, I think now I feel more, and I think the students are more are happier because I can just, just critique all over their studies when they show them digitally. I can mark everything in red. I can move things around. I can do anything that I want to with that. Uh, and it makes the experience for them, I think, much more pleasurable because they feel like they're actually getting a real, like real serious critique as opposed to, you know, let me get through this because I'm tired of drawing with my mouse. You know what I mean? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it took me, it took me a, like, I think a half a term to figure it out. But once I got that iPad Pro and Apple Pencil, it just was like, yeah, what took this, what took me so long to do this? You know what I mean? So. Um, I just I just saw Sarah's comment um, uh, about mural uh, M U R A L. Just a reminder that there are two. It's a branding yeah. problem. Yeah, it's I a use brand, there's a branding problem. <laughs> there's one. One is Miro M I R O, and the other is Mural M U R A L. Um, there's going to be. I don't know who's going to blink first and change their name, but certainly Miro M I R O. I think yeah. is very good, yeah. and you get the feeling yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of being in a yeah. classroom because all the students can see each other's work at the same time. And that's okay. Thank that's you so nice. so much. That probably saved me a lot more because I use mural <laughs> for collaborative and other experiences. Like, hey, great! Now it's gonna get into type. But thank okay. you, I appreciate sure. that. Uh, a question: Have you found that teaching remotely, and and this goes back to, you might want to change your eight phases tie. That teaching remotely has caused you to reflect on the content of what your classes were when you were physically in the class. Has reflect it, on the content, what do you mean? Well, reflect on what you were teaching and how you were teaching. Maybe you said, wait a second, maybe we should do this a different way, even if we go back physically. Huh, yeah, well, I don't, as far as the content is concerned of the course. Or, that... well, it, it could be content, it could be maybe, what is changes in the hierarchy of what they should be learning? Mm -hmm. Has teaching um, remotely changed that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, it's changed that for me necessarily as so much as it's, it's, it's changed the way I teach it, some, but not too much. I mean, I, I teach my type two class the same way I teach it if I was in the, if I was in the room. I just, my tools are different, that's all. Okay right? My tools are different. Um, but I will say that um, one of the things that, that, that's quite frustrating for me in doing it remotely is, you know, the, the lack of attention span <laughs> and, keeping, <laughs> and keeping, you know, I don't, I don't like calling people out for not, list, for not paying attention, you know, like, you know, looking at their dog and pet while, while we're on the Zoom <laughs> session. Um, I mean, that's really frustrating. And um, I know it's difficult. If there was a way to deal with that better, I, I think that that would be something I, I would love. But um, when we're in little boxes, like the Brady Bunch, you know, and you're, and you're talking about something really, really important, and, and Peter and Jan have their faces this way, it's like, no, it's like, you guys, this is, you got to pay attention, right? So that's, yeah. the, that's the one frustrating thing for me. But everything else, I think I, I teach my classes the, the way I normally teach it. Good, good to know. Raphael, hi, you have a question. Hori, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, okay. So I have a question. i uh, from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. I teach at uh, community, community College, Mohawk College, and I teach type on the, both graphic design and advertising. So uh, graphic design, I started just a year ago, but I've been teaching in the advertising program. And I don't have the luxury of having several classes in advertising. And today, it's the answer to Ty and, and, and Simon for the suggestion of condensed typography program, uh, because it was extremely difficult to, to get what I think was essential for them to get into to be an art director. So they have art direction and uh, 
to talk about the copywriting, they have a three copywriting classes and that helps a lot you with the type. And uh, what other things that helps a lot is the understanding in how photography and illustration helps with the type composition too. So they understand the relationship and the spacing and light and light and that's extremely important for them. But my question is uh, for for both of you or for any other uh, prop here on the on the chat, how we would condense this uh, uh, in just they just have one class on typography. I try to put models in other classes that I teach on the program, but that is specific class that today was a lifesaver to see all that content. But what else we put in a way to uh, advertising creative student? I know you have a, a very good creative advertising program at Art Center too. Uh, what they have uh, when it comes to advertising? I think I think this might be our last question, and I think Simon and Ty, you, thank you, Raphael. I think you can. Simon well, at the very end was talking about what is essential, and right, Simon. And if you look at, we're going to post the video. There's one slide that I think. Simon, I saw that. I yeah, saw that. That's that's I what that. I think you should look at. Um, but Simon, didn't we try to do that? Do one of these kind of boot campy. You're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. The phone was ringing, so I had to turn myself off. Um, it's a similar problem to what my colleague Alison, as I mentioned, is dealing with when she's dealing with product design students. They only have time for one class. So she gives them some basic typesetting exercises to start with, some, you know, maybe three weeks of that, maybe three weeks of, of compositional exercises, maybe then has them work on a typographic logo um doing their own kind of resume or something like that maybe their own name that they have to create a, a unique identifier out of um and then maybe you know i'm just trying to think i don't know how long your term is how many weeks do you have um, uh i have a uh, 14 weeks 14 so you know i think you could get some good grounding with uh initial let's call it just typesetting and then composition uh, and then maybe um, composition with regards to an image. If they're in advertising, they need to obviously start to put those things together. Um, and then obviously, so you don't include copywriting in that period. It's just about design. Uh, it's just about design, but okay. uh, sometimes they, they pick some of the content they create in the copywriting class with the other prof. Right. And come here and apply on the, on the, on that class. Great. I mean, so, I think 14 weeks should give you enough time to then maybe end with a last project, which is larger scale, maybe a poster, maybe their own imagery or something. So with typography and image become combined because that's what ultimately they're probably going to be dealing with. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Simon. You know, that's, you know, um, because it's advertising, they always have to include an image in the class, unlike, yeah. you know, maybe a product student. Can I, can I, can um, I talk have, about that? Well, we have ahead. three Ty. minutes, Ty. Yeah, let me, let me, let me address this because <laughs> uh, I've had some, some experiences with um, advertising students uh, in, my, in my Type 2 class. So Art Center a few years back made it so that um, advertising students, other uh, majors could, could cross-pollinate. They could take classes uh, in the graphic design department. And my Type 2 class was one of the classes that became really popular and a lot of the advertising majors uh, wanted to take that class, right? Um, and uh, our department, you know, reserved a certain number of seats for the advertising students. So what you got was, uh, at, at one point, was a mix of mostly graphic design students and then a few advertising students, right? Graphic design students come in with a, le a, a lot more understanding of typography than advertising students, right? So advertising students, their whole thing is, they're thinking about display sizes, right? headlines, slogans, right? Big, bold statements on an image, right? So that's what they're thinking. They don't come in with, the, um, with that, that sensibility that they need to have and, and patience that they need to have with typographic form. So what I was experiencing was the type, the, 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 the advertising students in the class, the graphic design students, the work they were doing was horrible. It was horrible. 
And so what I had to do was I had to stop the, the advertising students from coming in to getting into the class. And I told the department, I said, listen, I will do a type two for advertising students only. Okay. So that way everybody's on the same playing field. Right. And that way I could slowly go through and really get them to understand the, the basic skill sets that they need. It's like, you guys, it's not just about display fonts. It's not just about display sizes. You need to know the minutia of typography if you really want to communicate well. And once I did that, things got better. And now they don't, they don't try to get into my type two class with the other graphic design students. So, so I've been down that road. So I understand what you're saying. So my, my, my advice to you is to, with your advertise, advertising course, is to really get those students to understand the minutia of typography because with those skill sets, it's gonna make their use of, of, of larger display and subhead fonts and things of that nature much, much better. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, before, before we leave, there's a huge group here. We do have two items of swag, I call it. And they were generously given by Tyrone and Simon. And instead of asking a question and everyone competing, and Dan Evans will get it anyway, um, I'd like to know who is crazy enough to still be here from the furthest point. Um, if someone has come from, who is here from the furthest point? Must be Lucas, surely. Or Pavel, where, where are you these days, Pavel? If he's not here anymore. He's not answering. If he's answering, he's not. Under he's in here. Russia. He's, uh, are you in Russia, Pavel? You have to. Yes, yes. So I think Pavel might win for the furthest. <laughs> and then Lucas yes, it's, is it's in Sweden. In so hmm. these are our two Let's, furthest people. Pascal was raising a hand. There's a competition. <laughs> Pascal, how, where are you? He's in Australia, yeah. she said. She, oh, whoa. I think oh. she's in. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Australia, Russia, and Lucas. Well, I'm going to... There's a Russia close to us. <laughs> Are you Are in you Russia, Armenia? too? I mean, there's a Russia that's not that far from that <laughs> no, other direction. No, 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 no. So there are three of you. I have to applaud you. I'm going to make Ty... Um, we're going we're gonna to give a third one. Ty, you're going to yeah. make... You're going to give... <laughs> Look at Ty. Yeah, that's fine. I'm good. So we have, we have, I'm going to share my screen. So I don't know if you looked at it online. We have Ty has generously and Simon given their limited edition. Ty is the, uh, for the furthest. And that would be, I believe, Pavel and who's in Australia? Pascal. Pascal. Pascal, right. We're, we're going to, you're going to get a queen of soul. Limited edition poster. I don't think I have it. Oh, well, you have to look on the website, okay? Both you and Pavel, and then Lucas, you will get a limited edition, Simon Johnston, The Weight of Type. Weight of Language. Oh, The Weight of Language. <laughs> oh, God. And um, boy, both, all, both of them are just outstanding. So if you haven't seen them, go on the website, and we'll, we'll need your addresses because they are real. They're not virtual. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Simon and Tyrone. Thank you. Sure, thank and, you. Thanks, everyone. And tomorrow is variable tights. Good night. Thank you guys for attending. Yes. Thank you.